Hello, Pastor Heath Jones here. I'm recording this during the week of Christmas in the year 2020, and by the time you are hearing this, I trust that you have already celebrated Christmas in your own fashion and in a safe way. Perhaps you even came out to our Christmas Eve service, which we held in our parking lot, transmitting the service through FM radio straight into your cars so that you could listen with inside the warmth of your own vehicles. And um, if you were there, you know that it was a lovely time and you might uh, Google Northwood Christian Church Christmas Eve and you can see some of the news articles that were written about it and some of the videos that were made about it. It was a wonderful thing. All this to say, this has been a very busy week, which is why I have asked my dear friend, Jen Fisher, to provide this week's message. She did ask that I read the scripture passage for consideration today, but I asked her to uh, preach for me in my stead, and she graciously said that she would do so. And so without further ado, I introduce to you the scripture passage and then what follows, which will be my friend Jen giving the message. The text for consideration is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and it reads, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Good morning, Northwood. Merry Christmas to all of you. Here we are on the last Sunday of 2020. Whew. I am coming to you from the Sanctuary of Trinity Episcopal Church at Meridian and 33rd, where I serve with the Sunday dinner program. And I am looking around this beautiful space and reflecting on the year with all of you. And my, what a year we have had, right? COVID-19 has changed our world completely. It's heightened our awareness of the fragility of life and it dramatically altered our routines. For a while there, travel ground to a halt, the economy took a severe blow, millions lost their jobs, and the inequality that we've lived with all along was brought to the surface. People secluded themselves from others. We all became experts at using Zoom, kind of. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> the change in our basic routines, the decision fatigue, the fear of death and the unknown, it is just, it's too much. It's more than any of us should have to deal with. We've all been living on edge in this constant state of anxiety for almost a whole year now. On one day in mid-December, more lives were lost to COVID-19 than they were on 9-11. And then it happened the next day and the day after that, and the losses just keep coming. But if we're reflecting on the year, then we have to admit that disease wasn't the only thing threatening us this year. We had a record-breaking year for hurricanes on the Atlantic coast, a record-breaking year for wildfires in California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado. I think I heard an estimate that said that around 20 million acres of land have burned, including, including the beloved redwoods and sequoias of Northern California, which we don't know yet if we'll get back. And in Australia, where they also had a record-breaking year for wildfire, it was estimated that a billion animals died. And as if all that weren't enough, we also witnessed the horrific murder of George Floyd, a black man face down on the pavement, slowly being suffocated by a white police officer. It was yet another traumatic slap in the face to the black communities of our country who were already dying of COVID-19 at unequally high rates. It pierced the conscience of millions who had been in a state of denial over the systemic racism and white supremacy that is built into the very foundation of our nation. And it prompted thousands to take to the streets in hundreds of cities across not only our nation, but the world. Minneapolis burned, Seattle was barricaded, stores were looted and hundreds were tear gassed around the country. All while we were dragged through the most polarizing presidential election that any of us can remember 
a barrage of tweets, a dramatic series of debates, a president who came down with COVID. I mean, the politicizing of science was a hallmark of 2020. Your stance on wearing a mask became defined by your political affiliations. And yet somehow, thank God, we were able to hold a safe and fair election. Now, here we are at the end of this dumpster fire of a year, as some call it, and we're about to turn another page in the calendar, if you still have paper calendars. But really, not much is changing. Life still goes on. People keep dying. We keep turning on the news, waiting to hear the next unimaginable thing headed our way. And yet, and yet, and yet, while we've buried loved ones, we've also welcomed new babies into the world. We've graduated, we've fallen in love, we've gotten married, started new jobs, planted gardens, celebrated birthdays and anniversaries with extra creativity. We've moved into new houses, spent more, side in time, spent more time inside of them. We've learned how much we love and miss our relatives, our grandbabies, our grandparents. We've realized how much we need and love our church community. And we've learned to cherish a simple hug, to avoid a casual handshake, and to embrace the fresh air of a hike in Holiday Park. In summary, we've examined what makes life worth living. The author of Ecclesiastes was searching for the same thing, wondering what makes life worth living among all the misery around us. Ecclesiastes is an ancient Hebrew book written to help us understand how to live in a world that is often beyond our understanding. The regular refrain is vanity of vanities, it's all vanities, or to put it simply, life is absurd. When your pastor Heath asked me to preach today on this last Sunday of 2020, he told me to choose a passage that had been resonating with me and the only one that I could truly think of was this one, the funeral passage. You may have heard it once or twice this year like I have at the funeral of someone you love. The truth is, especially in this context, I find it comforting. When I am losing my patience with life in 2020, I just try to remind myself that this is a season. Now, I don't share all the pessimistic theology that the author of Ecclesiastes shares throughout this book, but I do appreciate some of his conclusions that because we don't know what will become of our lives, we may as well live in the moment, enjoy our work, eat, drink, and be joyful. And I would emphasize how much more worthwhile all of that is when you spend your life devoted to the people and values you love and cherish most. Here we are now on the heels of Christmas, a Christmas unlike any other, a Christmas when tables have had more empty seats than they should have had, when so many are without work and resources. And this is supposed to be this time when we are reminded that there is an inbreaking of light in the world. But if I'm being honest, I find it hard to buy into that right now. That the light of the world has come to us in the form of a newborn baby. But then, you know, I look into the face of my gorgeous baby boy who was born in September of this dreadful year. And as I watch his sweet little face shrivel up when he cries or see how he searches for the faces of his mama and daddy or lights up with smiles when he sees his big brother as he's learning to laugh for the very first time. And you know what? I stubbornly have to admit that I get it. I get why God would choose to bring joy, peace, love, and life into the world in the form of a baby. This little baby full of light who would grow up to be a man of fire, an all-consuming fire of love that would captivate your heart if you let it. You know, I like to wonder sometimes about how old Jesus was when he first began to realize his calling. I mean, at what point in his life did the meaning of his life become clear to him? Or, you know, honestly, maybe it never did. I mean, maybe that's the whole point, that he lived every moment of his life on a breath of prayer, from his childhood home that led to that first dangerous sermon in the temple to his quiet, bold prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. I do believe that he was finding the meaning of his story as it unfolded as well, that he is the ultimate example, maybe one with 
you know, this sense of assurance and, and this gut feeling that he was God's, but still this example to us of a life lived in faith and obedience to the Lord. I find a lot of comfort in thinking of Jesus this way, not as the cosmic Christ who transcends the ages, but as the human Jesus, full of fear and love and longing, just like me. There's a season, a time for everything under the sun. And while I don't believe that God ordains bad things to happen to us, I do believe that when bad things come our way, our God is right here with us, fighting to bring us life among the darkness. This passage in Ecclesiastes that embodies the fullness of life, it's this juxtaposition of the messiness. It's the grief, the love, the joy, the pain. It's all in there, and it's all stuff that we're going to experience during our lives. And sometimes we can find meaning in it, and sometimes we just can't. And that has to be okay. And so while I'm longing to do the normal things this New Year's, to have my Christmas traditions as they should be, to get dressed up and to go to dinner with my husband, to visit my grandma and put my baby into her arms. Well, I am longing for these things and I know you are too. I'm also trying my best to stay faithful, faithful in the wisdom that this is a season, that there is hope on the horizon. My Jesus, sweet baby Jesus reminds me that hope is worth having. And I'm finding my Jesus right now and the images of hope I see around me the images of those workers loading case upon case of vaccine vials onto FedEx trucks, the social media posts and the text messages from my family and friends who work in the medical field who are letting us know that they are getting their vaccines. This is where I'm finding hope in our world right now and this is where I'm finding my Jesus. The Archbishop Desmond Tutu who's brought me a lot of hope this year, he says to choose hope is to step firmly forward into the howling wind bearing one's chest to the elements, knowing that in time, the storm will pass. So I invite you, Northwood, I invite you to join me in reflecting on the lessons of this year by meditating on this poem in Ecclesiastes. May we remember as we enter 2021 that the storm is not over, but it too shall pass. And may we walk forward into the howling wind, trusting that this is a season and choosing to embrace hope.